mountains of evidence and oceans of evidence. Their oceans soon become little streams. Their mountains become molehills when you look at the facts. And so we go on, in addition to Mark Storfer and looking up that alley and seeing nothing or seeing no car or didn't see a dog, we hear about the other witnesses who become pretty much part of the timeline. Ms. Clark does take some licenses regarding time. She says that Mr. Goldman leaves Metzaluna, and she says about 9.50 p.m. She says he goes home and he changes clothes, that he talked to Stuart Tanner about getting together later that, after, that evening. Remember that? Talked about going to Baja Cantina out at the marina. You know, wouldn't you think it would be logical to expect if you worked all day, when you went home to change clothes, you might have showered, you might have gotten something to eat. Especially if later on, when you hear Mr. Sheck, you look at the amount of food, undigested food, that was still in the stomach of these two victims. But in a rush to judgment, in a rush to contort these facts, this Clark tells you yesterday, let's give him five minutes. He's been working all day, he's got to change clothes, he's got to come home. Let's give him five minutes or ten minutes. Be correct. She says, let's give him ten minutes. That seems to me to be really, really fast. And what it really is, ladies and gentlemen, is more of that speculation. She doesn't know how long Mr. Goldman was there. None of us know that. We know he changed clothes. She has absolutely no idea. But, so you understand that when you look at when somebody says something like that to you. And then as part of their timeline, she tells you yesterday that there's something sinister in Mr. Simpson seeking change to buy a Big Mac from McDonald's. I suppose that if you're in this jealous rage, if the fuse is running so short, it's interesting, isn't it, to stop, go get a hamburger at McDonald's. Does that make any sense to any of you? Does it make any sense to you to drive to McDonald's? And there's no evidence that he tried to tell Cato Kalin not to come. The evidence is that these two men got in the Bentley and went to McDonald's. The evidence is that while O.J. Simpson is in this murderous rage, he's worried about money to tip the skycaps at the airport because he has $100 bills. So he gets $20 from Cato Kalin. What's unusual about that? Cato Kalin's living there for free, so I suppose he could give him $20. Then Cato Kalin wants to go get something to eat. And Ms. Clark says they could have gone to a restaurant. Well, you could do anything, I suppose. But the facts are, they went to McDonald's to get a hamburger. O.J. Simpson ate the hamburger. Presumably, he was hungry. Now, what's sinister about that? Unless you're cynical in your view totally of this case. Cato Kalin, their witness, they called him. They turned on him. You observed him. I ask you to hold him up to the same standards you do all the other witnesses. But I ask you, don't, quote, don't misquote him. Tell the truth about what he had to say. And so when he says 1040, or 1040 to 1045, don't try to make it 1052. So if you believe in this prosecution's theory, there's this blood leading down to this rear walkway. And Ms. Clark told us yesterday and unveiled her theory. Here's what they ask you to believe. O.J. Simpson comes home from these brutal murders in a Bronco that he must be driving awfully fast to get back in this time frame. He parks his Bronco out there the Rockingham Gate, somehow gets in the gate, gets down the side of his house, and what does she tell you? He bumps into the air conditioning. Now let's, let's, let's examine that for a minute. The evidence is that O.J. Simpson has lived in this house for 17 years. Who do you think knows this place better or the best of all? This is his estate. This is where he lives. This is where he's raised his children. This is where he's been married. This is where he had two marriages. He knows this place. So, as part of their fantasy, their theory, their speculation, they have O.J. Simpson walking down this walkway, running into an air conditioning. Well, if he ran into the air conditioning, where's all the bruises that he got from running into the air conditioning? Where's the sound that he made? 
That doesn't make any sense. You see, the reason why they come up with this running of the air conditioning, because they can't say he climbed over the fence. Because there's too much shrubbery there and it's not broken. Now, you really don't know if he could climb over the fence with this arthritis. But they have him then walking down this walkway, bumping into the air conditioning. But ladies and gentlemen, you know, we're talking about common sense here. Bumping into the air conditioning, and then he just leaves? Is that what happens? And let's look at this. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. You all remember this. And what, what exhibit is this, Mr. Douglas? Excuse me. 116. I'll stand over here so I won't be in your way. Thank you. Under this scenario, under their scenario, while Allen Park is out here somewhere, looking over in this direction, they have O.J. Simpson rushing back, parking the Bronco out here, and some way or other, he gets all the way down here. Remember Furman told you how far that was. Gets all the way down here where this air conditioning is, out here by Cato Kalen's room. You'll see this right here. And they have him running into this air conditioning so he doesn't know his own house. And he's all the way back here, and she says the reason he's back here is because he's going to go back here and he's going to bury the knife in the clothes. Now, isn't that something? How does she know that? Just make that up out of whole cloth? Do you believe that's reasonable? Is that reasonable to you? Does anybody on this jury believe that? That's what you were told yesterday. He runs in this air conditioning and then just, you know, he bumps in it and he drops his glove. That's what she told you. Doesn't make any sense at all, does it, ladies and gentlemen? Doesn't make any sense at all. No sound from Cato Kalen. And then what kind of, you know, the sound has always been very confusing. Maybe not to you, but to me. And Kato Kalen goes, it's more like a signal than anything else. Come out here or whatever. But those are the facts of Kato Kalen and what happened. And that's her theory. That's her reasonable, rational theory that you have to buy into, which I think that you will find to be totally ridiculous. I remember down this same way, there is a door into that side room there. Mr. Simpson wanted to get in his house. What would stop him from going in that side door? Who knows his house better? If he wanted to be, not be seen, I'm supposed that he would know better than anybody else. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. What they're now trying to tell you. And here's something else that's equally implausible. She tells you that the reason why Mr. Simpson couldn't stop and hide these clothes is because he's too famous and too well known. Remember that? She said, O.J. Simpson is too famous and too well known to stop and try to hide clothes or whatever of that nature. Well, let's take that just a little bit further. Part of what makes their theory so ridiculous is that is O.J. Simpson going to get in a white Bronco that's well known in Brentwood drive over to his ex-wife's house, park the Bronco in this well-lit alleyway that you've just seen, leave the car there, everybody knows him, knows that car. That's equally preposterous. So she can't have it both ways. He's too famous to stop and try to throw things in a dumpster, the way she put it. Isn't he equally too famous to be driving this car to go over there under these circumstances? That is preposterous. So if you believe the prosecution's theory, and they told you all this about a bloody trail. Where's the blood back there, ladies and gentlemen? There's not one drop of blood. Where's the blood back there? Where's the trail that leads to that glove? And further, look at this. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Not something I'm making up. You're seeing this with your own eyes. Look at the glove. Now, when that glove is picked up, remember, the, is there any blood on the ground? Any blood on that shrubbery? Any blood on anything there? Where's the blood? Furman and Van Adder, as we discuss them later, will say that when they get that glove after 6 o'clock in the morning, it's still moist and sticky. Remember their testimony? Where's the blood on the ground? Where's the blood on the leaves around there? Where's any of that? That glove looks as though it's been placed there. That glove looks as though it's been placed there. If you look at A, you'll see how far it is 
out to the street. So their theory doesn't hold water, it doesn't make sense, and so they get mad at Cato Kalin. And they tell you why he's biased, he's just indebted to O.J. Simpson, so we just can't trust him. But yet they want you to trust him, about the knocks on the wall, and he becomes part of their theory. But their theory doesn't make sense. And when you were back there, deliberating on this case, you're never going to be ever able to reconcile this timeline and the fact there's no blood back there that O.J. Simpson would run into an air conditioning on his own property and then under her scenario he still has the knife and the clothes but what did she tell you yesterday well he still has the knife and he's in these bloody clothes and presumably in bloody shoes and what does he do he goes in the house now thank heaven Judge Ito took us on a jury view you've seen this house you've seen this carpet if he went in that house with bloody shoes with bloody clothes with his bloody hands as they say where's the blood on the doorknob Where's the blood on the light switch where's the blood on the banister where's the blood on the carpet that's like almost white carpet going up those stairs where's all that blood trail they've been banding about in this mountain of evidence you'll see it's little more than a river or a stream they don't have any mountain or uh, ocean of evidence it's not so because they say so that's just rhetoric we this afternoon are talking about the facts and so it doesn't make any sense it just doesn't fit if it doesn't fit you must acquit and so she has him then still with the knife still with these bloody clothes and then she does something very unusual again on the time remember she gave mr goldman ten minutes to get dressed and to go over to Nicole Brown Simpson's house with this envelope. <laughs> Mr. Simpson, she says, who walks in this house in the walkway, and by the way, they were wrong. She was wrong about something else again I'd like to read you. She was wrong in her description. Of Allen Park. I can locate it. Allen Park says, he saw this figure in the walkway only and so that we're clear about that let me just read it to you I don't have to just tell you what I think it is I'm gonna read it for you 20571 council line 17 yes I saw a figure come down well not come down but I saw a figure come into the entrance way of the house just about where the driveway starts so a figure come into the entranceway of the house. Just about where the driveway starts there. Do you see that right there, the driveway is? That's what he said. Yesterday they were trying to put it all down here and have him come, because that was convenient to their theory. But that's not what the witness said. You look at the facts of this case and you'll see. Not what they tell you. Continuing it on. There is absolutely no evidence at all that Mr. Simpson ever tried to hide a knife or clothes or anything else on his property. You recall that Furman, and when I get to Furman, we'll be spending some time on him, as you might imagine, but one of the things he said was that he encountered cobwebs further down that walkway, indicating if that part is true, and I don't vouch for him at all, there had been nobody down that pathway for quite some time. And so she talks about O.J. being very, very recognizable. She talks about O.J. Simpson getting dressed up to go commit these murders. And just before we break for our break, I was thinking last night, about this case and their theory and how it didn't make any sense and how it didn't fit and how something is wrong and it occurred to me how they were going to come here and stand up here and tell you how O.J. Simpson was going to disguise himself he was going to put on a knit cap and some dark clothes and he was going to get in his white bronco and this recognizable person and go over and kill his wife that's what they want you to believe that's how silly their argument is and I said to myself 
Maybe I can demonstrate this graphically. I'm going to show you something. This is a knit cap. I'm going to put this knit cap on. And you've been seeing me for a year. If I put this knit cap on, who am I? I'm still Johnny Cochran with a knit cap. And if you look at O.J. Simpson over there, and he has a rather large head, O.J. Simpson in a knit cap from two blocks away is still O.J. Simpson. It's no disguise. It's no disguise. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Good time, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our mid-afternoon recess at this time. Remember all my admonitions to you. We'll stand in recess for 15. And Mr. Cochran, you may continue with your final argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience thus far, and we'll start up again and see if we can make it to dinner. Um, when we left, just before we broke, I was sharing with you a knit hat or a knit cap that we've heard so much about in this case. And it reminded me that there was testimony early on that uh, Detective Lang had uh, refused basically to pick up a knit cap inside the Brown residence uh, that was shown to him, I think by some of the lawyers and one of the investigators on that date. I guess these are fairly common. But they don't really disguise anybody who's noticeable, do they? And although I was the guinea pig here this afternoon, if you were to put a knit cap on, how's that going to disguise you? We've been together. I know your face anywhere now. And you know mine. And the people in Brentwood, in West Los Angeles, would know O.J. Simpson. They know his car. They know him. That's where he lives. Even the prosecutors say he's so famous that he can't go anywhere where he wouldn't be recognized. Now, one of the things about this people's timeline or whatever is that you recall that OJ's, some of O.J.'s bags were already packed outside of the house on that bench when Cato came outside to investigate the thumps, which he'd heard. And this is interesting because... The prosecutors have kind of talked across purposes on this. Cato at some point comes out because he hears these thumps, allegedly. And he has a little tiny flashlight, or I think the court called it a pen, a pen light or a mag light or something like that. And it was something small because it's dark back down that walkway. And apparently he went part way down that walkway and then he came back. It's interesting, isn't it? He came back and at some point he lets Park in. I remember all these questions about opening the gate and everything. Remember, there's a dog there. Isn't there a dog there named Chachi? There's a lot of talk about these dogs, and you've heard a little bit about these dogs. But one thing that I think is, is the prosecutors make these kind of wild speculations. You now know that the Akita dog was bought by O.J., as was Chachi. Remember, one of the dogs died, and like a good dad, he let the dog stay at the other house sometime with his son, Justin. And they named the dog after Cato, was I think the understanding of what we've, you've heard from, from uh, Arnell. But at any rate, I point that out because we know there was another dog over there named Chachi, a black dog, black chow. But while he, Cato is out looking for these thumps, of the, what happens to these thumps, Mr. Simpson talks to him. In fact, they go in the house together because Mr. Simpson is going to help him look or help him find a larger flashlight. And then someone says, or he's reminded, that Mr. Simpson's running late for his trip. So then he then takes off. My understanding of the facts is Mr. Simpson said, I'll call you later and have you put the alarm on. Because he was getting out of there. Parks was already there. But I think the interesting thing to remember is that some of the bags were already down, including that golf bag, were already down there. This was not any unexpected trip. He started putting things down there. If you look at everything in a cynical fashion, you heard this morning, aha, there was a knapsack over or a nap bag or some little bag they were talking about over in the driveway. Well, if you're a golfer, isn't it reasonable to assume there's golf balls in there? And if you put that in your golf bag, I mean, what's the big deal? Because they've got to try to theorize and try to explain anything. Explain everything, which they can't explain. They weren't there. They rushed to judgment. 
and it leads to this kind of wild speculation. You have to do that when you don't have a case. And that's all you've seen them do time after time after time. With regard to that walkway, lest I be totally clear to you, if O.J. Simpson had been the one for whatever reason to walk into that air conditioning, where is the hair and trace? Where is the fiber? Where is the blood? They want to tell you about his hands, fingers bleeding one minute, and it stops bleeding. In Ms. Ms. Clark's scenario, he bleeds, it coagulates, stops bleeding, then it starts bleeding again. Because that's convenient for her theory. You know, as I listen to both of them, I wanted to call them doctor. Dr. Clark? Because Dr. Clark told you, well, gee, look at that blood drop. That, that cut wasn't big enough for that blood drop. She's not any doctor. How does she know that? Dr. Darden, for the love and the forlorn. He, he knows everything about relationships. He just speculates on and on and on. He's got this great, vivid imagination. The only thing is, this is real life. This isn't anything for murder, she wrote. If they tried to sell this story to murder, she wrote, they'd send it back and said, that's unbelievable. You're going to see that as we tie it together. But it's nice to have vivid imaginations, but not in this courtroom. Because here, you are searching for truth on this journey for justice. So we know that Cato had some concerns. Uh, he was looking around. We know that at some point, Mr. Simpson comes down the stairs carrying the Louis Vuitton bag or whatever. And then Mr. Simpson leaves about 11, 11.02 for the airport. I think that's pretty clear based upon the evidence. And you recall that Ms. Clark again gives Mr. Simpson five minutes to rush in. According to her theory, he rushes in, changes clothes, disposes of all these clothes, showers, packs, does everything, and comes downstairs and says, composes himself. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, who do they think they're talking to? In five minutes, he does all these things. And then they tell you that, you know, under this post-homicidal uh, way you act, uh, you get yourself all composed and you just do this. This is preposterous. They're not experts. They can't testify. Those are just their, their wildest, rankest theories. You use your common sense when they tell you things like that. O.J. Simpson was O.J. Simpson. The way he always appeared by the people who knew him and talked to him. We'll talk more about that when we talk about demeanor. But the reason they can't explain his demeanor and the way he acted like he always acted, they then talk about, well, you can't tell who's a murderer. I mean, those are all real convenient words, aren't they? But they fly in the face of reasonable activity by a reasonable man on that particular night. So there's Alan Park. O.J. Simpson comes down within five minutes of the time they, they believe he goes upstairs. No time to dispose of bloody clothes. What about blood on the carpet? What about dirt on this white carpet? How does he shower? How does he get dressed? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Park himself says the golf bag was already packed and ready to go when he pulled into the driveway. And Miss Clark went to great trouble to tell you how credible she thought Mr. Park was and how he tried to lay everything out. And I think, by and large, uh, we agree with that. But I think if you're going to quote Mr. Park, you ought to quote him accurately and not attempt to mislead or whatever. And so what I did was I went back to the transcript again. When Ms. Clark told you and showed you that photograph yesterday about whether or not Mr. Park saw or was looking at the Bronco or looking for the Bronco on the night of June 12th. Remember that? She told you yesterday I spent a long time with him. And so I remembered and I ask him questions and his response. I asked him at some point, I'm asking you if you look to made an effort to see if there was a car parked. Answer, no. Was that a correct answer at that time? Answer, yes. All right. Question. There might have been a car parked there and you didn't see it? Answer, correct. And the reason why you don't know one way or the other is because you weren't focusing on any cars or paying any attention. Isn't that right? 
And I went on to ask still another part of this question. Basically, your goal was to get Mr. O.J. Simpson, try to get him to the airport on time, isn't it? Answer, that's correct. Question, that is what you ended up doing, isn't it, sir? Answer, yes. And that's the testimony. So it's fine to come up here and tell you, because they want to fit their theory, that, well, you never, you didn't see that Bronco out there and do all this drama, but isn't it better to read the record, if you want to be accurate, which I've just done for you? Now, isn't it reasonable to ask Mr. Park also, well, Mr. Park, if you were around the premises there and you were up at Ashford and down at Rockingham, did you ever hear a Bronco come driving up? Did you ever hear a door slam? Did you ever hear an engine of a Bronco? And fortunately, we asked him some of those questions. I'd ask him about hearing a, seeing a Bronco in the past, and remember he talked about seeing one back in 88 or something of that nature. And so then I asked him this question. And would I be correct in assuming that those engines can be loud on occasion, those cars, meaning the Broncos? Answer, could be. Question, you didn't hear the engines on any cars or anything that sounded like a Ford Bronco that night, did you? Answer, no. Now, again, I've read from the transcript for you. I previously read to you about where Mr. Park said he saw Mr. Simpson in the entrance way of the house. We'll put that aside. So we know that Mr. O.J. Simpson was preparing to leave for this trip that had been long planned. And when we summarize then the two timelines, it seems to me that their timeline is not even reasonable. It doesn't make any sense. It's a much less credible version than the testimony you've heard from our witnesses. Their version does in no way disprove, disprove the defense timeline. We don't have to even put that forward, but we did. There then must be a reasonable doubt. Consider everything that Mr. Simpson would have had to have done in a very short time on their timeline. He would have had to drive over to Bundy as they described in this little limited time frame where there's not enough time. Kill two athletic people in a struggle that takes five to fifteen minutes. Walk slowly from the scene. Return to the scene, supposedly looking for a missing hat and glove and poking around. Go back to this alley a second time. Drive more than five minutes to Rockingham where nobody hears him or sees him. Either stop along the way to hide these bloody clothes and knives, etc., or take them in the house with him where they're still hoisted by their own batard because there's no blood, there's no trace, there's no nothing. So that's why the prosecution has had to try and push back their timeline. Even to today, they're still pushing it back. Because it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't fit. That's why they abandoned Ellen Aronson. Why they abandoned Dan Mandel. Why they didn't want to call Denise Pilnack. Why they didn't want to call Robert Heidstra. That's why we're now hearing this preposterous add-on of time that the thumps may have occurred at 10.15. That's Ms. Clark's wish list, but that's not the evidence in this case. Now let's turn our attention for a moment and let's look at some other things that don't fit in this case. So I started to say before, perhaps the single most defining moment in this trial was the day they thought they would conduct this experiment on these gloves. They had this big build-up with Mr. Rubin, who had been out of the business for five, six, seven, eight years. He'd been in marketing even when he was there. But they were going to try to demonstrate to you that these were the killer's gloves and these gloves would fit Mr. Simpson. You don't need any photographs to understand this. I suppose that vision is indelibly imprinted in each and every one of your minds of how Mr. Simpson walked over here and stood before you and you saw four simple words 
the gloves didn't fit. And all their strategy started changing after that. Reuben was called back here more than all of their 